Chelsea. I'm here with Matteo Vinci from Vinci Technologies, who's helping uh, get the link up and everything. Uh, Quequa, I'm the founder and operator of Quequa, which is the Quantum Education Center of WA. I've written an introduction course to quantum computing, which has 150 people enrolled and uh, very happy with the way that that's gone. And it's been a great learning curve and about to follow that up with a more advanced um, on each section. So feedback has been wonderful. Of course, quantum computing has taken over the world and we're all looking forward to that. And that's a good segue into um, Mark Jackson. So I'd like to just, uh, Mark, if you can give a wave. <laughs> Um, Mark, uh, Mark is uh, the scientific lead at Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, they are typical, typical uh, Matteo Vinci feedback. Um, Cambridge Quantum Computing are the leaders in quantum chemistry and quantum machine learning. It's all very, very exciting. Uh, the, the amount of projects out there at the moment that it all gets down to the exponential uh, computational power of quantum computers. So we're going to be doing computations that we've never ever done before. And Mark will discuss how that fits in to the simulation of quantum chemistry and machine learning. And uh, also talks a bit about quantum key distribution, which is quantum cryptography, because that's horrendously important in the financial, in fact, I was going to say in the financial world, but in every world, politically, et cetera, et cetera. So um, do I pass on to Mark just to Mark? What was that, sorry? Do I pass on any word to Mark? Yeah, yeah just so that he can continue. Yeah, okay, look, I don't want to um, talk too much about what we're doing here, because the exciting stuff is what, uh, Mark's doing so. Mark, if I can pass over to you, and um, yeah, you can ask any questions uh, during the presentation, and we'll write them down here, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So, me to speak. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I, I've never been to Australia. I would like to go sometime. I feel like this is kind of halfway there to be able to do this. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you all for joining, and. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking tonight. Um, I wish the circumstances were better, of course, but uh, but I think this actually does, th this gives us a lot of motivation for understanding the importance of science and especially quantum computing. And so, so I think uh, there is a bit of a silver lining in this. Let me share my screen here. Um, the host has disabled screen sharing for attendees. Maybe you can do something about that. So that panelists can share. Iman just mentioned about security. I think a lot of you have seen headlines about the relevance of quantum computing to cybersecurity, and that definitely is an issue. And uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to talk too much about that tonight. Um, but I can say a few words about it. That you've probably seen that quantum computers have the capability to hack a lot of encryption, and that's because the mathematical formulas that we've been using for decades, and which have worked pretty well for normal computers. It turns out those use the mathematical formulas uh, which quantum computers are really good at undoing. And we didn't know that 40 years ago when we designed this, of course, because there were no quantum computers. And so this is a, a real threat now. It probably won't happen tomorrow, but in 10 years or even five, this really could happen. We could use a sufficiently powerful quantum computer to undo uh, a lot. And so that's the bad news. The good news is, that people have already started taking steps to protect against that. And, uh, and so there's actually a contest right now by, by a US government agency called NIST. They've invited people to do their best uh, to submit different, different formulas, which we don't think quantum computers are good at hacking. And I, I wanna emphasize, we don't think, we actually don't know for certain, but they've started this contest so that people can submit these, these ideas and that way we can kind of test them out right now before we actually put them into practice. So this is very much work in development. And, uh, and then, okay, that's still not, I'm not able to share here. Um, yes, um, yeah, it says I'm not able. Oh, there we go. Now, 
now I can. All right, so can you all see that screen there? Yep, all good. Good, good. Good, so um, yes, uh, so, so I do work at Cambridge Quantum Computing and I will be talking about quantum computing and COVID-19. And I wanna say something up front um, and that's that quantum computing will almost de definitely not be able to help with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I, I wanna say that so that there's no misunderstanding, but it has highlighted the importance of several things, including vaccines for diseases such as COVID-19, the susceptibility of some individuals to this, why some people get it and some people don't, and things like supply chain efficiency. And, uh, and we see this all the time now in the news. And so these problems have really come to the forefront and these are the types of things that quantum computers could help with. And so, so if there's some silver lining to this, it's that uh, we understand that this is something that we need to work very hard on. So in this presentation, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about Cambridge Quantum, uh, a little bit about quantum computing in general, and then focus on the three areas, or sorry, the, the kind of the two general areas where quantum computing can help, and then I'll, I'll briefly discuss the roadmap for what I think the progress will be like. So just to tell you a little bit about uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing, we were established in 2014 and we now have over 100 employees. And funny enough, that actually makes us one of the oldest and largest quantum computing groups in the world. Uh, we, we actually have quite a unique origin story. Uh, our founder and CEO, Ilias Khan, is chairman of the Stephen Hawking Foundation. And uh, in 2014, Hawking told him, quantum computing is going to be big you should get into this. And so, uh, so we're very fortunate that, that Stephen Hawking indirectly uh, started our company because of this. Uh, we have over 60 scientists, about two thirds of the company are actually scientists and over half of them have PhDs in the subject. So there's a lot of expertise in this area. We are the official advisors to the British government on this. Um, so we're delivering a series of presentations on different aspects of quantum computing. Uh, to the largest British corporations. And, and we're doing this at no cost, uh, just to help them get ready for the quantum revolution. We have four focus areas in the company. Um, and these, these make up two general sides to the company. So the first side includes quantum compilers, uh, we actually call it Ticket, uh, a quantum chemistry program, and quantum machine learning. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. And then on the other side of the company, we have a focus on cybersecurity. And so we're actually developing our own hardware for this. Uh, whereas the, the first side of the company, we're developing software, but it runs on the computers built by Google and IBM and Honeywell and Microsoft and such. So we're not actually building the machines to run it on. We're just developing the software, uh, but we have partnerships with all of the hardware manufacturers. So I don't think I need to tell anyone on this call, uh, the importance of this. I think for the last three months or so, this is about all that we've been hearing about. Uh, and I, I Googled the statistics today. So these are unfortunately the current, uh, the current statistics. And so this really has impacted us in so many ways, uh, both, both health-wise and financially. And so of course, it's natural to wonder if there's anything that we could do to prevent it, if not uh, solve the problem right now. You know, quantum computing is a very exciting technology and, uh, and it has a lot of promise. And this is kind of a quick overview of some of the different applications that people have been looking at. Uh, so these include chemistry and pharmaceuticals, uh, industrial goods, information technology, and finance. And, uh, and I, could, I could spend a lot of time talking about all of these different points. And I've included kind of a, a few different companies who are already starting to invest in these different areas. And some of them uh, we have have collaborations with and some uh, are working with others. But I, I just wanna emphasize that a lot of groups are putting a lot of money into this already. This is not science fiction. This is already happening right now. And almost every week you see some new headline of, uh, of some new discovery and some new company who's investing or collaborating in this. So in this presentation, I'm just gonna focus on, on these aspects here circled in yellow, uh, like the protein folding and drug discovery and the logistics and planning. So this is, this is what I'm gonna focus on today. So for quantum chemistry. So quantum chemistry was actually the very first idea for quantum computing. In fact, this was how quantum computing was first thought of 
uh, back in 1982, Richard Feynman realized that normal computers would never do a very good job analyzing chemistry. And this was because as you, you have a molecule, as the molecule gets bigger and you add more and more atoms, each atom has several electrons and every electron in the whole molecule is interacting with the other electrons. And so we know what the equations are. We've known for a hundred years, but as you get more of them, it becomes tougher and tougher to find a solution. And so this cloud-like thing here, that actually represents the electrons, the, the lowest energy configuration of the electrons. That's really what you're trying to solve for, is what are the electrons doing? And for a small molecule, like on the left side, you can solve it. This would be doable on, on a computer today. You could solve it in some moderate amount of time. But if you look at this molecule in the center, that's more typical of what you would want to do for, uh, for pharmaceutical or material science type applications. And we couldn't even come close to being able to do this on a normal computer. And it's not just a matter of, well, computers get better every year, so maybe not today, but maybe in two years we could do it. But this is far beyond anything we could even hope to do on a normal computer. And Richard Feynman realized this 40 years ago, and he realized, you know, we need to start thinking like nature. And nature thinks in a quantum way. We have all these quantum equations. We should develop a quantum computer so it actually does the calculations using quantum physics. And so this was the impetus for quantum computing. Now, of course, no one knew how to do that 40 years ago. It's only in the past few years we've really understood how to make this to scale in a, in a commercially feasible way. But we're already starting to think about applications. And so on the right-hand side, I've kind of presented a few different things here. So on the top right is, is fertilizer. About 2% of the world's energy supply goes into making fertilizer. Unfortunately, we know that we're very bad at it. It's horribly inefficient. We know that bacteria are much better than us at doing this. We just have no idea how they do it. And so the hope is that if we were better at chemistry, we would be able to understand this better and make more energy efficient fertilizer. A second application is more energy efficient materials like solar panels or better batteries. And then third is, uh, is medicine. And so there's a, a few different aspects of this. So the most important here, one here, is personalized medicine. So you might not have ever realized, but we kind of have this one-size-fits-all treatment for medicine. Uh, we, we have one medicine that we design, and it takes decades, and it's a very expensive and, uh, and risky and costly for a pharmaceutical company. But we design one drug to treat one condition. And for some people, that might work great. Uh, for other people, it may have no effect, and for a few people, it may even have unfortunate side effects. It may actually harm them instead of helping them. And this is the best that we've been able to do, because when it comes to medicine, we're basically guessing and then checking. We have to kind of guess what, what effect a molecule would have on our biology, and then we do it in the lab, maybe on animals, maybe on willing participants, and then we just kind of have to find the best one after trying dozens or hundreds of samples. And of course this takes a long time and it's expensive and it's costly. Wouldn't it be so much better if we could actually design it from scratch, uh, just as we design a building on a computer long before we ever go into a construction site, uh, we could actually take your genetic makeup, so we, we actually have your genes specifically, and we have your condition that we're trying to treat, and we design a drug just for you. And so for every person, it'll be unique and it'll be most tailored to them. And so this is the dream. This is what we would like to do, to, to maximally treat the condition and minimize the side effects. But we, we would never be able to do that with a normal computer. Our command of chemistry would not even let us come close to that. So the idea is that with a quantum computer, we could have personalized medicine. You could design a drug just for one person based on their genetic makeup and their condition. So the way that we would do this uh, specifically we studied the docking. So this is when you have some sort of target molecule. So this actually represents us. This is our biology, the molecules in our body. And then we have a ligand or a short molecule which comes from the drug. And so you want to see how the ligand fits into this target molecule. And so, so you want to see how the molecular structures mesh together. So these are kind of some schematics here. Uh, the top one's a little bit simpler, the bottom one's a little bit more complex. But this is what we want to, to simulate on a computer. And these are some of the things that we can do right now 
in quantum computing. These are actually some of the specific calculations that we can do. Um, these are not all of them. We, to really do this commercially, uh, there's a lot more. But, uh, but for the experts in the audience, these are some of the things that we think we could do in the next two to three years. And so we really are studying to tackle this seriously. Now, the way that you would actually do this on a computer is that you have your target and you have your ligand and you prepare your system and you set up your docking calculation. So the computer actually simulates the ligand docking into the target protein and then it assigns the score. So it figures out how well it fits in and how effective it thinks it would be. And of course, this isn't quite a science yet. Uh, people have different algorithms for determining this docking process and the scoring process. But this is the general flowchart of how you do this. And you do this for a lot of different samples uh, and you, you try a lot of di different configurations. And so you have your collection of scores and then you just look at the ones that are the most promising and you, you study those in more detail. So this is the overall flowchart of how you would go about computationally designing drugs. And I found this great simulation from a laboratory so that's the target molecule. And then it will introduce the ligand. And it's trying all the different configurations of how that would dock. So it's going through all of the possibilities. And for each one, it's assigning a score. And so then once it finds something that's promising, it can kind of zoom in and it studies it in more detail. Until it comes up with what it thinks is the best configuration, which would be that. So that's a, that's a typical docking simulation. And this is the kind of thing that we would want to do on a quantum computer. So this is how you would do it on a quantum computer specifically. Now, the first thing that you should notice is you notice how we divide it into a classical computer component and a quantum computer component. And this is a very general phenomenon. We think that actually all calculations on quantum computers will actually have a classical component. We will never be using quantum computers by themselves. It will always come in this hybrid model. And that's because quantum computers are great for some things, but they can only solve a, a very small subset of problems and right now, there's not even that many problems that it can do. And so, uh, so we, we think that most of the heavy lifting, especially right now, will actually have to be done on a classical computer because the classical computer can basically do everything. Some things it just can't do very quickly, but it can basically do everything and you know that you'll get the correct answer. And so what will often happen in chemistry is that you will compute the energy so that when you do your, your chemistry calculations, you calculate the energy of a configuration, that's very quickly done on a quantum computer. But all of the minimization, kind of the machine learning algorithms, that's actually done on a classical computer where it's trying to figure out how to kind of wiggle the, uh, the ligand in there to try to make it better. Um, and so, uh, so you see that, that it's split between them. And this is not unlike having a GPU next to your CPU. And so your code assigns some things to the CPU and some to the GPU. They each do their thing and then the results are synthesized at the end. And so, uh, so again, we think that this hybrid model of quantum and classical is going to be a very generic feature, especially in the short term. So that's a, that's a quick summary of how chemistry could help. And again, unfortunately, it probably won't help us develop a, a vaccine uh, for COVID-19, but maybe in 10 years or so, it would be able to design vaccinations for, uh, for different things uh, based on our individual genetic makeup. So the second thing I'd like to address is quantum machine learning. And you've probably seen a lot of headlines like this. These are taken from actual uh, news clippings I saw online, and I just took screenshots. And so you see that these are grocery store and, uh, and supply chain type urgent issues. But there's also issues related to medical staffing. So you have the staff and you have the equipment and the facilities and everything. And all of these need to be coordinated very well. To, uh, to maximize the efficiency. And so these kind of optimization and, uh, and scheduling problems, these are part of a much larger class of problems. Uh, we, we call it machine learning. And 
all of the machine learning that you're probably familiar with for normal computers actually have one thing in common. They use probabilities. And probabilities are just numbers between zero and one. And so they're actually pretty simple. Um, so different machine learning algorithms use probabilities in different ways, but that's the one thing they have in common. Now, quantum computers, on the other hand, they use quantum machine learning, which doesn't use probabilities at all. It uses something called an amplitude or a vector. And that's mathematically very different from just number because a vector or an amplitude, it has a direction. And when you're adding them together, you add the head of one to the tail of the other. So depending on the relative angle, they could either add together constructively, we say, or they could cancel each other out deconstructively, we say. So the mathematics is completely different when it comes to machine learning than classical. And so I, I really want to emphasize that quantum machine learning is not just classical machine learning, but faster. It's mathematically completely different. And it has the potential to see patterns that would have been completely missed by classical machine learning. And so that's really what we hope to, to exploit. So this is a, a simple problem that a lot of you might be familiar with. It's called the knapsack problem. So, uh, so it, it's pretty easily explained. So suppose you have some sort of knapsack and it can contain so much capacity. Uh, so here I've used kilograms because you're in Australia. Obviously we're kind of ridiculous in America with the pounds, but, uh, but you have some sort of capacity and you have different objects and each of them has a weight and each of them has some sort of value. And you're trying to maximize the value that you can carry with you given that constraint. And problems like this are found over. This is a very ubiquitous type of problem. Um, optimization and scheduling, cryptography and storage all use very uh, uh, just simple variants of this problem. And this is something that has actually been studied on a quantum computer. So, so this can be solved on today's quantum computers and it scales pretty simply. Uh, so it's basically the number of items that you have plus something related to the capacity of the knapsack. You add those together that's how many qubits you need. So roughly, if you want to study five items, you would need about five qubits, very roughly. And so that's something that we can certainly do today. So IBM, for example, has a five qubit processor available for free on the cloud. And there's more qubits available uh, uh, with specialized access. So this is, this is a, a 10 qubit version that CQC did uh, for, for a potential client just about two weeks ago. Uh, this, is, this is actually new. This is not published. You're one of very few people who has ever seen this. And so uh, we actually didn't have access to it yet because there's a queue for the 10 qubit machine, but this run on a simulator. But, uh, but we did do the five qubit on a real machine. And this 10 qubit one, this is actually state of the art. No one has ever done a knapsack problem on a quantum computer or simulator this much. And right away you see how different it is from a normal computer. Whereas a normal computer, it has to check all the possibilities one by one, and then it finds the single best solution. You notice that the quantum computer kind of does them all simultaneously. So this readout here, this is typical of how a quantum computer uh, displays the end of a program. So there's 10 qubits. So you see that the horizontal axis there, it runs through all the different possibilities of, of what those final 10 qubits could be. So each one could be a zero or a one. And so it goes through every single permutation and at the end it just sort of says the rest um, because we know that we know where the correct solution is. So we're gonna focus on that one. And you notice on the vertical axis you have probabilities and one is clearly preferred. This is the correct solution. And so uh, we did this a thousand times. Um, so 525 those times, a little over half, we did get the correct solution, but we didn't get it all the time. In fact, almost half the time, we had several other possibilities. And this is very typical of a quantum program. It's much faster, but it will not always give you the correct answer. So you, you usually have to run it several times to find out what the correct solution is. And so uh, this is something that, again, we've, we've already done. This is kind of a, a state-of-the-art version. Ten items in your knapsack isn't so impressive, but we believe that we could scale this up to, to have hundreds or even thousands of items in a knapsack. And that really would be something, something very impressive. And so uh, I wanted to show that this is something that's being done right now. So what kind of progress do we think that we can be making? 
So this is a chart based on something that IBM has publicized. Um, I think most of you are familiar with Moore's Law, which basically says that the power of a, of a computer, a classical computer, doubles every 18 months or so. And quantum computers are on a similar trajectory, but actually even more impressive. The power of a quantum computer has doubled every year, every 12 months or so. So that represents those gray dots uh, for the past history. So this, this is indicating the quantum volume here. They have funny names like Tokyo and Johannesburg and such. And this solid blue line represents the predicted performance. If they continue to double every year, that's the trajectory we'll be on. Now, this pink line here, this is what Honeywell believes they can do. So actually this month they're coming out with a quantum computer, which is double the volume of IBM's. And furthermore, they claim they can double, or sorry, uh, increase by 10 times the quantum volume every year for the next five years. So after five years, that's 100,000 times improvement. So that's on a very different trajectory. That means by just 2023, will we'll be at virtually the same level as IBM would have predicted by 2030. So if Honeywell is even close to this, this would be game changing. And this is why we're so excited about, about uh, developing quantum software right now. We think there's a lot of commercial applications that will be possible just in two years or so. And so, uh, so it really is amazing. Again, this is very new information. This was only announced about a month ago. So, uh, so you're one of the first to be seeing this. One thing, that, uh, that you need is a compiler, just like with a normal computer. And CQC offers the only compiler which is compatible with all the major hardware brands right now, like IBM and Google and Honeywell and Intel and, and IMQ and such. So you can write your quantum code in whatever your favorite uh, version is, uh, like PyTicket or Q Sharp or, or Circa or whatever. And you can use our compiler to execute it on whatever your favorite hardware is. It not only executes it though, it actually finds the most efficient way to do that. Especially now, since we don't have that many cubes that are kind of noisy, this is especially important. And so uh, if there's any actual uh, quantum developers in the audience, I would really encourage you to use it. Uh, we're giving it away for free right now. You're welcome to use it for free. I can just send you the GitHub repo link and, uh, and you go ahead and use it. And we, we really would like your comments. We wanna know how people are using it and if you have any ideas we can certainly take that into account for future generations. Um, just a few weeks ago, we announced our new version, which includes uh, Honeywell support. So this is an example of how it optimized different things. So on the left-hand side, you might see, this is what a circuit looks like, sort of an abstract form. So the horizontal lines are the qubits, and these different blocks and operations, these are the different gates, the operations we do on the qubits. And what Ticket does is, it converts that into a different mathematical structure, which can be more easily optimized. We find the shortest path or the least number of operations to achieve the same result. And so on this right here, that's sort of what, what it looks like by the time it actually gets compiled. And so as I mentioned, we, we just unveiled a new version, 0.5, which includes support for Honeywell's processor. And uh, as, in, as Honeywell recently invested in CQC, uh, we're actually one of the first beta testers of that we have almost exclusive access. So again, if, if any of you are developers, we're happy to speak with you about working together. So to conclude, um, the knapsack problem is an example of a, a quantum optimization thing. And, uh, and we think that we could actually do it on a 20 qubit machine quite soon, uh, which, which really would be a new record. We think this is an example of how close we are to commercially viable machine learning. We think in just three to five years, we could get commercially viable applications, and we're speaking with a lot of companies right now about this. Um, if, if any of you are interested in this, uh, we'd be glad to talk with you. I know that some people think that maybe right now it's a little bit too early, but keeping in mind that it takes time to develop any sort of software, quantum or otherwise, uh, this really would be the time to do it now. And the ones who will benefit most from advances are the ones who have already started working on this. So, uh, so here's my contact information, if any of you would like to get in touch. Um, that's it for the prepared part, but I'm happy to stay as long as, as you'd like and answer any questions that you might have. So let me stop sharing, and there I am again.
Yeah, look, uh, um, thank you very much indeed, Mark. That was uh, excellent as usual. We do have some questions. Um, I'll start with uh, David Kachatrian. He's saying, for the knapsack problem, did you use QAOA algorithm yes. or Grover Search or something else? It was indeed QAOA. Right. Okay. Um, hopefully that will be okay for David. From Aritra, <clears throat> is the ligand matching problem based on VQE? How many logical qubits would be required for the COVID SARS? to 30k bp genome or for human dna of 3.2 billion bp um i can answer the first question i don't know the answer to the second one so i believe it is based on bqe um it is certainly true that whenever we're trying to find the ground state of a molecule we are definitely using bqe so so for those of you who aren't familiar um the bqe stands for variational quantum eigensolver and so basically what you're doing is when you have the equations in chemistry, those are the equations for what the electrons are doing. You're trying to solve that so that it minimizes the energy. The electrons are kind of in the lowest energy configuration and you're trying to figure out what that is. So what you do is you make a guess and then you try to nudge it a little bit. You kind of nudge what the electrons are doing to try to find a lower energy version. And so, so you keep doing that and you keep kind of trying to find your way on this hill of, of energy and then once you get to the bottom and, and you find you can't nudge it anymore to reduce the energy, then you just say, okay, that's, that's the solution. Um, and so, so it sounds complicated when I say it, but, uh, but quantum computers can do that very, very quickly. Uh, it can very quickly identify what the energy is and then how to adjust things to, uh, to go a little bit lower. Um, so we do use VQE. I don't know how many qubits would be required to, uh, to do this for, COVID? Um, that's a good question. I know it's far beyond what we could do right now, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, from David Carr, will quantum computers, when they eventually are viable, uh, be available for general consumption? You know, cost would be a major issue, of course, but how general do you think they'll be um, in, in normal businesses in the future? Yes, so, so this is definitely an issue uh, if you actually want to use one. So cost is a funny thing. 10 years ago, quantum computers just didn't exist. So, so the cost was infinite. And then a few years ago, they existed, but no one could use them unless you were a researcher. And now IBM has put their five and 16 qubit machines on the cloud for free. There's, there's a queue, you have to get in line, but it is free. You just sub, you, you write your code and you submit it. And there you go. Um, they have uh, 20 and 50 qubit machines also available. You need to sign up for that. Um, and it, it's, it's not cheap. It's on the order of several hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars for a year's access. But, uh, but you have specialized uh, hardware support from their engineers. So that's all. So it's kind of expensive right now if you want to use their high machine and have almost exclusive access to it. But if technology has shown us one thing, it's that things that are very expensive now quickly get reduced in cost, especially when they can be distributed. Um, there will be a few companies and governments that will want to have their own quantum computer. Like if you were like an aerospace military dis, um, uh, engineering type company, you, you probably would want to have your own quantum computer uh, for security and because you would use it all the time. If you're just a company that wants to casually use it for machine learning type applications, you would you would certainly use it on the cloud and so you wouldn't need to pay a million dollars a day or something um, you would just pay for it like an amazon subscription you just pay for a few processors that you spin up you do your calculation and you get your answer so right now it might be a little bit beyond what most companies would be comfortable with but i think within a few years that won't be the case it's going to be reduced very dramatically and uh, and we're already starting to see that Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mark, if I can ask a question. Um, I often talk about with, um, I heard this from Scott Aronson. I take it you know who Scott Aronson is. I do know Scott. Yeah. Um, and he's right out there. But he made a, a very good point, and I'd love to hear your comment on it. What he's sort of saying with the um, 
supercomputers, the digital supercomputers we have at the moment, we're in complete control. You know, we, we shoot voltages up and we know whether it's one or zero and we're, we're totally in control. With quantum computers, which are basically using superposition um, entanglement and tunneling, we have n almost no idea how those forces work. And he was, introdu he was introducing the issue of A, when the quantum computer does its computation, how do we know it's right? And B, is it of any concern that nature is controlling, let's say when quantum computers are ubiquitous and running the world, is there any issue that nature is controlling these computers? Good. So let me, I'll have the first one. Um, how do we know if the answer is correct? So this is why it's so important to develop these programs early. Uh, so right now with the like 50 qubits at most, we can do problems on a quantum computer that we could also do on a normal computer. And so we can check the answer. And so that's why, like with the knapsack problem, we know what the answer is for those problems. And so we can check things uh, to make sure our algorithms work correctly. Um, as up, we will get to the point where we will be able to check it classically. Uh, so yeah, so uh, so right now it's important that we, we compare the answers. Um, so the second question you asked, uh, is it strange that nature will be in the driver's seat and we won't completely understand what's happening? So quantum physics is strange. That's definitely true. It goes against most of our day-to-day -day intuition. Um, we know the mathematics of it. Uh, it it's just, yeah, again, not intuitive. Um, but with normal computers, a lot of the, the weirdness is kind of hidden because we're, we're used to dealing with definite numbers. Um, computers work in binary. We work in base 10. But... Uh, the number system is basically the same, and we usually kind of have some intuition for what a computer is doing. Um, it, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be, I think we'll still be able to do it. I think it's just more of a struggle to kind of write the programs and, uh, and get our head around how to take advantage of quantum computing. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think there's any deeper issue about that. Yes, I, I, I agree with you. I don't know whether Scott was just trying to um, put it out there and make it even more mysterious. But what's your uh, uh, um, opinion of the collapsing of the wave function and consciousness collapsing the wave function? You know, the observer effect. Mm. And there's a lot of work going on. I don't know whether you know on the... Um, um, the Institute of uh, Noetics, checking on whether it's consciousness that's collapsing the wave function. What, what's your opinion of that? Sure. So I, I really don't know very much about it. Um, I, I did physics research for many years. Um, unfortunately, I, I really don't know much about the, the philosophy and, and different ways to interpret it. Um, and, I, and I actually don't think anyone does. If they really had a conclusive answer for this. I think, uh, I think it would be very profound. Um, we, again, we know what the mathematics for quantum physics is. It's just very counterintuitive. And things like collapsing the wave function, yes, we know when you do an observation that changes the state and, and becomes a measurement and such. Uh, I don't think we know formally what it means, who, who's qualified to do that. Uh, there's this famous story of Einstein and Bohr walking down the street as they debated this and Einstein said, well, you know, do you think the moon doesn't exist just because a mouse is not looking at it or something like that? Um, it's not clear who gets the privilege of getting to collapse the wave function. Is it us? Is it a smaller animal? Um, it, it may very well have something to do with consciousness. Uh, I, I, I don't know and I, I just don't think anyone else knows at this time. Yes, look, that, that is just a, a fascinating aspect of um, quantum physics in general. And I know Dean Brandon from the Institute of Noetics is, is um, 
screamingly trying to prove that it's consciousness because if it's consciousness then a thing called micro psychokinesis which is the projection of consciousness affecting an article uh, or an object um, yeah it's just amazing stuff but they're getting there but like you say not inconclusive um, another question from Chris um, for the cloud QC how does the industry efforts look like in the infrastructure how far has the new industry on hyperconverged infrastructure and the providers like Dell VMware uh, Huawei Lenovo and the likes contributed yes so Huawei does have a quantum computer um, I have heard it's available on the cloud it could be um, I'm, I'm less familiar with the Chinese efforts um, but um, uh, Alibaba certainly does have their their quantum computer on the cloud. In fact, they were one of they were the second after IBM to do it. I think they had an eleven qubit machine on the cloud. Um, so uh, so yeah, because quantum computing is so specialized, a lot of these companies that you've mentioned that are that are uh, giants in normal computers, they don't have a quantum effort, at least none that we know of. And so uh, so IBM has theirs on the cloud. Google has one. It's just not on the cloud. Um, uh, Xanadu is doing photonic quantum research, and they put theirs available on the cloud. Um, yeah, so it, it's different. Um, oh, uh, Amazon, uh, that's an obvious one to discuss. So they're kind of funny. They, they are doing their own quantum effort. They're trying to design their own hardware and their own chips. It's not publicly available yet. In the meantime, they are kind of uh, reselling the, the processors of others, so Rigetti and possibly Honeywell and Microsoft. Um, I know Rigetti's on there. I don't know who the other two are. I know there's three. Um, so Amazon obviously has, has the cloud infrastructure to do this, but right now they're providing access to three processors, not themselves, um, but th they're developing the rows. They're, um, soon they'll probably make that available. Thank you, Mark. Another question, is the, uh, are the D-Wave machines more useful now than the IBM's gate-based quantum computers? Can we do something with D-Wave for COVID now? Because D-Wave has claimed something like that. Uh, David says he can't remember the exact wording, but they are making some sort of claims there. Yes, so, um, so to quickly summarize, so D-Wave uses a very different uh, architecture than, than the other types of quantum processors that I talked about. So they use something called simulated annealing or, or quantum annealing or something. And it's when you have, they're again called qubits, you have them um, and you encode in the interactions between the qubits, your particular problem. And then the qubits find the lowest energy configuration uh, to this. And that configuration is the solution to your problem. I sometimes joke sort of like a Ouija board because you ask a problem and then the Ouija board sort of mysteriously finds the answer and you don't really have control over it, supposedly. Um, and that's sort of like with the D-Wave machines, you encode the problem and then you say go and it finds the lowest energy configuration, but you don't get to control the individual qubits. Now, D-Wave was the first to claim that they were a commercial quantum compute company. And it is definitely a computer. It definitely does something. It's a very specialized type of processor and it does things very, very quickly, but it can only solve that one particular type of problem that you can encode it in the couplings between the qubits. Um, so it's, it's not clear how it relates to a lot of what I've talked about, um, which are based on these so-called gate-based quantum computers in which you can, you can control individual qubits. I, I think I did see something um, on Twitter or something about D-Wave claiming that they can help solve COVID-19. Uh, I, I also saw it was, it was largely criticized by others in the industry because it, it can't. Um, they just can't. They possibly could solve other real world applications right now, but, uh, but I don't think they could solve anything close to COVID-19 today. Um, and, and I think they were largely criticized by others for claiming they could. Uh, yes, thanks, Mark. In fact, that's a good segue into um, another question, which is, um, there are many, well, there are 
and half a dozen different types of quantum computers, you know, superconducting and iron trap, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can you just give a quick overview of what is available? And if you had to put all of your, if you had to put your house on it, which technology do you think will be uh, the winner, if you like? Sure. Um, okay, so, so first I'll, I'll summarize what some of them are. And so these are all, these are all in the, in the umbrella of gate-based machines. So you, you can control the individual qubits, but the technology that allows you to do that is very different. So I'll, I'll review a few of them here. So the first, as you mentioned, is superconducting. And um, so this is an approach used by Google and IBM and Rigetti and half of Intel. And this is, this is when at very low temperatures, uh, some materials have very special properties, which al allows conduction on zero, um, zero resistance. And so it certainly works. Uh, it, it works well. Uh, I've seen we've gotten about 50-ish qubits. Um, it's incredibly fast. The operations happen in nanoseconds. The drawback is that they're very fragile. Uh, you have to keep them incredibly cold. Um, and so this requires a lot of, of cooling, these giant cryogenic chambers and a lot of infrastructure. And they're still very fragile, expensive to do. And so, uh, so there's advantages and disadvantages. The second most common is the ion trap technology, which is, um, so it's when you use lasers to trap charged particles or ions. And the advantage is that you can do it at room temperature and the, the qubits are much more stable in the order of minutes even. Uh, but the disadvantage is that they're slower. The operations take a lot longer. And so there's, there's a, uh, a balance there. This is the approach used by IonQ, which is a, a spinoff out of the University of Maryland College Park and also Honeywell. And they have incredible error rates. It's incredibly tiny compared to superconducting. And so it's, it's really showing a lot of promise. Uh, especially the past few months. Uh, a third approach is called topological. And this is, it's used by Microsoft, uh, is the only company that's using this. So this is it's when some particles called Majorana fermions, they have this special property that when you move them around each other, the quantum phase remembers that. And it doesn't matter how you move them around each other. It's only important how you do, how you do that with topology, right? So if you want to undo it, you have to just move them around each other. But any sort of wiggling doesn't matter at all. It's sort of like braiding hair. It only matters how you braided it. Even if you jiggle your hands a little bit, that's, that's perfectly fine. So the advantage is that it has almost zero errors because any sort of jiggling doesn't affect it at all. The disadvantage is that this technology is way behind the others. Uh, it was only first realized a few years ago. And so Microsoft hasn't announced even two qubits that they have gotten to work like this uh, at some sort of commercially viable way. Um, uh, whereas the others are talking about 50-ish qubits that they can offer, uh, Microsoft hasn't even offered two. Now, if they could get it to work and scale, that would be incredible and they would be the winners because again, the error rate is almost zero, but, uh, but that's kind of unknown. Um, a fourth approach is photonic. And so this is when you use photons or light particles uh, to, to represent the qubits. And there's two companies doing this. Uh, one is Xanadu in Toronto, and the other is PsyQuantum based in Palo Alto. And, uh, and I might mention that founder of PsyQuantum is actually the grandson of Schrodinger. Uh, so that's kind of quite a heritage uh, that he's, uh, he's already a leader in this field. And so, uh, yeah, so that's four different approaches that are being used within the gate-based quantum computing approach. And so, uh, so if you would ask me uh, which one I would, I would bet my house on, uh, I don't know about my house, but I, I would bet maybe a car, a used car. Um, uh, I, th I think Ion Trap and Honeywell right now shows the most promise. Um, I, I showed you that graph with their, their trajectory. Um, yeah, I, I really think they, that really shows the most promise right now. Um, it's, it's a bit like a marathon after one mile. Uh, it really is too early to say who's winning because they're, they're using different strategies. Some are trying to increase the number of qubits. Some are trying to increase the quality of the qubits. So we really don't know yet, but the race has certainly begun. Uh, this is being uh, investigated very intensely right now. And so I think you're going you're gonna to see a lot of 
uh, really impressive results in the next few years. That's a great answer. Thank you, Mark. Uh, much appreciated. Looking into the distant future, um, you're probably aware that when we get to 300 pure qubits, we'll be able to map to every atom in the observable universe. Do you have any comments on, on, on that fact? Sure, yeah, so this is, a, this is a milestone that's often given because what it says is that if you took everything in the observable universe and you made a computer from it, so you said every atom represents a bit, right? So that's, that's about the most amount of information that you could process in the observable universe, that can be encoded in just about 300 qubits. And so that means that a, you know, a modestly powerful quantum computer is more powerful than anything you could even hope to build, even in principle. And obviously, we're not going to use the whole universe to build a normal computer. And so this is a milestone that's often given to show just how powerful quantum computers are. It's not like the iPhone 7 compared to an iPhone 6. Sometimes when you tell people quantum computers are, are uh, going to solve problems, they think, oh, yeah, well, normal computers get faster every year, too, um, every year also. But I think this, this example that you gave, this shows just how different it is, that it can solve problems that we never could have even hoped to have touched with, uh, with normal computers. Yes, that, I mean, that is fascinating. Um, I've heard it called the unk unk, the unknown unknown. So when we, when we actually get to that stage, um, it really is gonna be amazing. Well, Mark, I think we've come to the uh, end of the presentation. It's, uh, I'd really like to thank you very much. Um, it's been a, extremely beneficial for everybody here. What is your normal advice you give to businesses who want to start looking into uh, the advantages of uh, quantum computing? We have a, a business, uh, the largest business in Australia, I think, or nearly, uh, Woodside. I don't know whether you've heard of Woodside. Um, no, I, I haven't. No, it's it's um, a huge uh, oil um, exploration company in in Australia. It's one of our bit, uh, largest companies, and it's actually made an announcement that it's now gone quantum. It's using quantum technologies. Um, what are you doing actively to to yeah to 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 include industry in everything we do? Sure, sure. So the way that we've engaged with uh, with industrial partners before is that um, sometimes we've we've approached them, sometimes they've approached us. Uh, we learn more about the types of, of technical problems they work on, what kind of chemistry problems or machine learning or uh, cybersecurity problems or or things like that. And so we we get them to suggest a few different things that are sort of bottlenecks, things that they would really like to improve. And then we go back to our scientists and we show them the list. And our scientists rank this and, uh, and they say, well, this we think we could do in the short term um, and it would, it would be moderately impressive. This is more of a long-term project, but if we could get it to work, it would be amazing. So we kind of evaluate it both on the time scale and the impact. And then together we identify something that we could do in a six month to two year time scale. Uh, so we sort of identify a proof of concept project where we will we'll study the problem and we'll do a very simplified uh, kind of MVP, like minimum viable products, like a, like a toy model type thing where we actually execute a program on a quantum computer. And so in the six month to two year time scale, um, we, we study this and then we decide, is there potential here? Should we keep investigating or is this something that probably isn't worthwhile investigating right now? And so together we learn, and, uh, and uh, this has been very successful. So sometimes it's continued to longer collaborations, and sometimes we just we know it's probably not worth looking into further right now. Um, and so that's, that's how we would start. Um, and they're typically not very expensive um, either. So we've, we've worked with a lot of companies, and we worked within their budget on this. All right, thank you very much for that, Mark. And, and on behalf of all the uh, participants and everybody here, we'd like to thank you for your insightful comments. Really much appreciated. And uh, going forward, uh, I hope we can talk again and uh, get some projects going for you and 
take it from there. But thank you again. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Iman, and thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. And again, uh, you have my email, so uh, please feel free to get in touch. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for attending.